Hello, and welcome to Making It Up. So the concept here is pretty simple. I get to sit down with some cool fellow authors and we have a great conversation. I get to pick their brains a little bit about their writing craft. And at the end of our conversation, we pick a random sentence from a random book from one of those books behind me in the shelves. And we use that as the first sentence to craft an impromptu short story that we put together. So could be genius, could be a shit show. It's definitely guaranteed to be unique. Do me a favor, go ahead and subscribe to my channel, please. And if you're looking to subscribe to a highly acclaimed, irreverent monthly newsletter, uh, then sign, go ahead and sign up for mine. Right now, my newsletter recipients have access to a contest and you can win a signed copy of my upcoming book, The Dead Husband, which is coming out in May of this year. Uh, you can do that at carterwilson.com. So today I'm interviewing Mr. Sean Eads. Uh, Sean is a writer and a librarian living in Denver, so not too far away from me. He's got a master's degree in literature from the University of Kentucky and a master's degree in library science from the University of Illinois. His second novel, The Survivors, was a finalist for the 2013 Lambda Literary Award. And his third novel, Lord Byron's Prophecy, which came out in 2015, was named the best book of the year by Kirkus Reviews, which is phenomenal, and was also a finalist for the Colorado Book Award and the 2015 Shirley Jackson Award. So you can find out more about Sean at seaneeds.net. And Sean's actually a buddy of mine. Like I said, we live here in Colorado together, and I got introduced to Sean years and years and years ago. Um, and he actually became a member of my writing critique group that I've been in for, geez, almost, can you hear my cat? That's Guff. So people who know my newsletter, know my dumb cat, that's him because I'm behind a closed door and he's just this desperate creature and he's got to just scream at me. Sean is in my critique group and he has been, we've been in the same group for, I don't know, 13 plus years perhaps. Um, so we're very familiar with each other's writings. We, you know, we've, we've had great opportunities to, to laud praise on one another and to bash each other about our writing. So that's the nature of the critique group, of any critique group, really. Um, he's very prolific. He's written um, scores and scores of short stories, lots of novels. You're going to find out more about him. He's also one of the funniest guys I know and kind of one of the most twisted guys I know. So enjoy this conversation. Shut up, Goff. With me and Sean Eats. How are you? I'm doing pretty well. How are you? I'm doing well. I'm 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 healthy. I'm not sick. Good. I, Good. Uh, it's weird because you read how bad the cases are, and I just don't even really notice it around me anymore so oh yeah yeah well I, i've learned that i'm in uh i fall into the second half of phase 1b so i will be getting my vaccine fairly soon fairly soon being march why, at this now, why is that librarians are designated as essential workers oh oh well so. i would agree with that librarians and grocery store workers <laughs> so we're all we're all essential workers and and so you had covid and i just they just came out today and they said now they think that buys you five months of immunity i mean i know you're well past that at this point but before it was like three months but yeah i still do have some antibodies i got i got tested in december for that oh, wow. physical so a, a few Okay. You know, I mean, I mean, whatever they would quantify a few, basically it just means that I was showing up as positive still on their, on their test. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Interesting. Well, listen, thanks for calling in. Um, yeah. I'm kind of excited to talk to you because I was realizing there's a lot I know about you, but there's a lot I don't know about you. And I thought this would be a good opportunity to kind of find out a little bit more, but so, so where did you grow up? I grew up in Lexington, Kentucky. So you born there. No, I was born in West Virginia, in Huntington, West Virginia, but but I've lived in lived in Kentucky. Parents moved there when I was about one years old, so it's really all that I ever knew. Once I got just a little bit older, my parents would ship my brother and I off to West Virginia for the summers to live with our grandparents. They believed that uh, they both came from pretty large families, lots of cousins and things like that, and both of my parents were the kind of the first people to leave West Virginia, hmm. I believe. And why did, what brought them to Kentucky? What was the motivation? 
Uh, my dad got a job. Okay. Um, my dad was a cytologist, so he's someone who kind of works with uh, cancer and screening tumor slides and things like that to diagnose cancer. And so he was working, uh, got hired on as a lab at a at a lab, and he was there for, gosh, thirty years or so before he retired. Hmm. Uh, so yeah, I mean Lexington really was about the only place I ever knew growing up. It's um, it's about forty five minutes to an hour from. Cincinnati so it's a little bit south a little bit midwest it's kind of got a a little bit of this and that I, I never quite felt southern growing up until I moved out here and everyone heard my accent <laughs> and then everyone said well what part of the hills did you grow up in so I don't I don't I don't hear that myself but but it still comes out if I get if I get excited a word like cement will become cement but you know that <laughs> so it's sort excitement of that does it huh you, yeah you yeah or tough excitement or alcohol yeah, I mean, yeah. you know they're kind of the same <laughs> so so it, was your mom working at the time as well when you were growing up uh she worked for the most part yes yeah. i mean once my brother and i got of school age i mean she she took care of us until we hit kindergarten and then uh and then yeah she uh she went to work um she did mostly clerical mm -hmm. things stuff like that i don't think she had a full college education like a four year like bachelor's yeah. degree i think she had maybe an associate's degree got um, it got it yeah and so you weren't influenced at all um by your father in the medical field that wasn't anything you kind of aspired to get into not at all. <laughs> I, I was, uh, I mean, I was an English major almost probably from birth, but I mean, by the, by, by, by like third grade, I was writing poems. Oh, okay. I mean, that, absolutely. In fact, um, and by, by sixth grade, I was writing poetry pretty seriously as much as serious as like a sixth grader can do anything. Um, you still have all that? And like, oh God, no, no. <laughs> Would I, you love to read no, that no. now? Uh, no, I really wouldn't. Uh, my my archive goes back. My personal archive goes back to um, tenth grade, tenth uh, grade, eleventh grade. I have a bunch of short stories. I have a bunch of poetry from that period. And then I did my first novel when I was twenty. Okay. I still got it. That was like five hundred pages long. It was so wow. All right. So, well, so let's back up a little bit. And I, and I also wrote poetry when I was like maybe in eighth or ninth grade and I still have it. It's fucking horrific. I mean, it's, yeah. it's, it's really, I mean, everything had to rhyme, of course. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Well, everything still should rhyme. I'm very much a formalist. Oh. I, 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 yeah, I'm, uh, I'm conservative formalist when it comes to poetry. Okay. So. Okay. Fair enough. So what, what do you none, think? None of this blank verse for me, sir. <laughs> right, no. So what, what was it? And I mean, you probably maybe don't remember all the way back to the third grade, but you obviously were, were writing creatively at a very young age. And do you have any memory of like what drew you to that? Were you reading early? Were there things that were influencing you that that maybe didn't influence your siblings? Um, second grade, I remember our te my teacher reading us uh, The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, actually. I remember that very well, which I don't think I knew. That usually goes over really I, it, well with second graders. Well, yeah. I mean, it was like maybe a Halloween thing or something, <laughs> but it, it wasn't, we weren't, she wasn't, I don't think she was reading it that we were supposed to understand anything that was going on in it. It was just the water, water everywhere and all the- The cadence and the- Yeah, yeah the, ca the cadence yeah. and- Stuff like Edgar Allan Poe, the bells, right. you know, things like things like that. Um, again, if I understood anything that was actually being said, probably not. Yeah. But the rhythm of the language, the interest of the language, and and like song lyrics, you know, in general, song. My earliest memories are probably um, running around the house to like Buddy Holly. Yeah. You know, yeah. Like Peggy Sue and so. Not you know, not very like, complex lyrics, those. No, 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 Sam, no Samuel Taylor Coleridge there. He, I don't think Coleridge would have made the, the top of the pops or American bandstand. True. True. Maybe 19th century British bandstand. Uh, he could have done that. I mean, but, <laughs> so in high school, you were definitely leaning the English major direction. You knew that that was, that was oh, good. Yeah. yeah. So totally. That's interesting. Like most people don't yeah. know at all what they want to do when they're going into college. I certainly didn't really, I, 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 where I went to school, that was kind of dictated for me, but like 
I didn't have this strong pull towards anything, but it sounds like you certainly did. Yeah. You know, one of the interesting things, because you wouldn't, Kentucky's not associated with higher education. I mean, that's a, that's a a terrible stereotype. I mean, and it's not associated with well-funded schools and certainly like my school didn't have like, you know, a swimming pool and a swim team and all that, you know, that sort of stuff, but it had a fairly robust English department. I mean, and we could, you, we could take a bunch of electives. So I, I had a lot of English language electives. I mean, Shakespeare, just a class on Shakespeare, uh, they had a popular one called composition through literature, you know, the American novel. Those were things hmm. that were, you know, that I, I mean, that was just completely what I was immersed in. Um, in 10th, 11th, and 12th grade. And then you ended up going to college where? University of Kentucky. Okay. Um, yeah, I didn't, didn't move at all, which is also in Lexington. Yeah. And then, and English major from the onset. And, and what, what was your focus while you were there? Um, actually, not quite an English major from the onset, oh. um, because I, I, because I didn't know what an English major could actually do. I, that, that was my next uh, question. Uh, yeah, uh, I was I was an education major. Okay, um, and was I was an education major for all of two semesters, and then I realized this is just not. I don't want to. I'm not interested in teaching, uh, hmm. at least at the high school or junior high or elementary school level. So I did switch. It's like, all right, this is where my 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 heart is in English literature. Um wherever that's going to lead me to, that's what I do need to major in. Hmm. So I knew it wasn't practical. I wasn't going for practical. I was going for uh, the care of my soul. If you (laughs) want to be really poetic about it, (laughs) but 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 that's what I needed to do. But I I find it, I just find it interesting that you knew so early that, you know, something that might not be pragmatic was going to be it. I I always find it fascinating when people just have that calling, um, even if they know it's, it could be setting themselves up for, for a long struggle. But then, so you were in college when you wrote your first novel, because you said you were 20. Uh, I, yeah, I actually, uh, maybe I was, I wrote it, uh, I wrote it the summer after my freshman year. Jesus Christ. And that was, that was unrelated to any, any course that you were taking. That was just a novel that you wanted to write. It was completely related. It's just a novel that I wanted to write. I said, I'm either going to do this or I'm not. Um, because, you know, I, the, the short story is kind of my preferred form. I, I love writing short stories. Um, I probably haven't written. It's funny. I mean, as much as I talked about getting into it with poetry, I probably have written two poems in the last 25 years. <laughs> I just... I just, you know, I read poetry all the time, but it's not something I feel like writing much anymore and just, and just haven't. Um, but, but yeah, the goal was, it's like, I want to be a novelist. You know, I, I want to be, I, I, if not a professional writer, at least I want to be a writer whose voice is heard um, and, and determine whatever I have to say. I want somebody to be able to hear it. Um, How long had you had that idea for that first novel before you wrote it? Um, it probably came to me a few months before I actually sat down to do it. And did any of your coursework that you had taken so far? Yeah. So my first novel, I didn't know what the hell, I mean, completely blind and it was terrible, but you, sounds like you had already had some coursework, um, both in high school and in college that maybe helped you figure out structure and maybe pacing. I think you figure out. I think you figure out, well, no, I mean, um, you figure that kind of stuff out by reading, I think, Mm -hmm. and you just kind of immerse yourself in it. I've never had a creative writing class ever. Um, So if you think about a class where they are going to talk about that sorts of things, about how do you structure a story, you know, those, those elements, I've never, uh, never done anything like that um you're talking more at like a high school level of talking about oh we're going to talk about theme and we're going to talk yeah. about symbolism and things like that now that's important i think for a writer it was important for me as a storyteller for sure um but i, I mean i just think you the, you do it and you develop a knack for it um was that you know. how much of a struggle was it though so 500 pages and what what did the book fall into any kind of genre 
Uh, it was it was uh, semi autobiographical fantasy horror. How <laughs> how about that? Uh, uh, I I mean I, I don't think I've made a say. I was a pretty lonely kid in high school uh, for for a variety of reasons, and I again I wasn't far out of high school. I was like a year out of high school when I wrote the novel, and uh, part of it was wanting to kind of reflect back on the like what the last couple of years had been and so you do have a character who's who isn't quite me but he has elements of me uh in terms of his feelings and in terms of his desires to kind of reach out and be friends with people to make friends to communicate with people and uh he's also kind of a paranoid person Hmm. as well which which isn't me i don't I don't think I'm paranoid uh, or I don't think I was paranoid then anyway. Uh, but, but um, what he discovers is that there's this sort of, you know, side uh, almost entity within him that kind of has this sort of fantastic power that will allow him to enter into other people's dreams and manipulate them. And what he, what he's doing in the story is he, is making other people his classmates have dreams where he dies Hmm. in them yeah yeah just to upset them and it's like it's like it's like somebody trying to gain and then the next day that you know the kid who had the dream would see him in the hall and would feel compelled to like come up to him Hmm. and say you know even though he's like never maybe never even talked to this person before it's it's like that fan. It, it, I mean, it's a play on that fantasy that some people have of, boy, if I kill myself, then they'll all really know, right. you know that, that you know at that you like they'll they'll really miss me then, or they'll wish hmm. that I was their friend. He's almost like simulating that. It's just kind of this weird sort of power that he develops. Um, so what happened to that book? Uh, that book is sitting in a massive Manila. <laughs> folder but what was your what did like you about do with that it when you finished i never did anything with it you didn't submit it uh, you didn't I, I i don't believe so it was more of a can i do this oh wow um, jesus that you practice uh, book. yeah in a lot of ways i mean my first old oh, seven novels were practice <laughs> wow my second my second novel unfortunately got lost um it was wow. written on a shared well it was on a shared computer that my brother and i had and uh, it was actually my brother's computer. And I don't remember, I'd given it some weird file name just because I didn't want it to be like, oh, Sean's second novel or something. I had some notion of my brother snooping, which maybe I am paranoid yeah. when it comes right down well, to Or it. maybe he uh, deleted it on purpose. Well, no, I actually remember we were downstairs and we were in the living room and my brother was on the computer and I was watching TV. And he goes, he was reading off, he was clearing up the computer and he came across this file and he read it and he said, can I delete this? <laughs> and I didn't recognize what my own file was. I was like, cause I, it was like some string of numbers were, or something. I, don't, yeah, it's, <laughs> I, I wasn't even, I was like, I was like, yeah, you can get rid of that. And he deleted it and he cleared the trash. Now this is like 1995. There was no backup going on then. There was, oh, there was no, not only was there no backup, but I mean, whatever the cost would be to try to, you know, extricate. Recovered the hard drive. Like a, yeah, cover file. And I mean, I realized it like five minutes after he did it. <laughs> I was like, oh, uh, Brian, did you delete that? He goes, yeah, you know, that was a novel. I remember the name of it. It was, I had, a, I was about a hundred pages into it. It was called The Corrupted Earth. And you never, did uh, you try to rewrite it or you, you just, no, you just I, jettisoned I, I, it? I, in fact, as a matter of fact, I probably went a year without writing anything. I was depressed it's, about it. That's devastating. It was. Yeah. I mean, you, you, you know, cause we've talked about it. One of, one of the last projects that I did is actually a novel called Lost Story yeah. that is about that's about Hemingway. I mean, Hemingway, Hemingway did end up losing like almost, I don't know, somewhere between 15 to 20 manuscripts of his that he wrote in his twenties. And that's a famous story. And people have debated on what the actual effect of that loss was to him as a writer. Hmm. But uh, it was, I mean, I had that memory very much in mind. It's like, yeah, I, I damn well know what it feels like to lose 
to lose like all this work that you've been doing for like four months. And there's just like, it's just yeah. gone. Poof, I, I mean, I, on a rare occasion, I'll lose 500 words for some random reason. And that to me is devastating. Right. And, oh yeah. and, yeah. but what's funny is when you go, I mean, if you're in the moment, when you go back to it, you find a better way to write it. That's the only way you can console yourself is like, okay, this is a better version of those 500 words, but like a hundred pages. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's, that's crippling. Yeah. So, but there's probably I mean, something wasn't... healthy about it too. You know, it's the ultimate editing, right? <laughs> you've you've it, let it go. I mean, it was... Yeah, that's, that's true. And it wasn't a very good novel in the first place. I mean, I didn't feel good about it even in, in, in the process of me writing it. Yeah. Though it was the say it was, you know, a book, first book I ever did that's actually set in Kentucky. I mean, it was kind of a crime story set in the hills of Kentucky about some people that are growing marijuana. Wow. Back in the days wow. when it, well, it's still it's still illegal in Kentucky, I believe, but back in the days when it was very, very illegal. Um, yeah. So so fast forward now to where you're at now. If you could if you could look back on everything you've written, what do you think? How many novels, how many short stories? Two poems we know. Uh, I must have at least 12 novels. Wow. Uh, maybe 13 that are finished. And again, I've only published three. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, so um, yeah, there's some of those manuscripts I thought were pretty good and I've tried to submit. Um, and they, you know, I've had some near near hits or near misses whatever you'd like to call with them but um some of them are some of them are 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 simply not marketable really it's like i oh i was interested in this story i wrote it for the sake of writing it but but it's not uh it's not necessarily like anything that anybody else is going to care about i mean you know for, for 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 various reasons um maybe a couple of times i'm not generally a very i wouldn't call myself a particularly experimental writer at all but there have been a couple of times where it's like okay i'm going to write a novel in fragments for instance and that sort of thing just to see how it would play out um so again there's a lot of a lot of stuff you could do in your 20s when it's like ah, I'm, i don't care i don't have bills to pay yeah <laughs> <laughs> i'm sure the fragment novel uh niche will come a huge when i'm in my 40s um so you know i, I I, I was just going to say, so you're, you're your own audience. You write, because I've had that question too, like who do you write for? And it sounds like you write for you. And Oh yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah. And hope and, and, and hope that my own concerns every once in a while can generate a, an audience that would merit the manuscript's publication. You know, right? Oh, absolutely. I, it's actually something. It's actually something I've been thinking. I've been I've been thinking a little bit more about about audience. I, over Christmas, I read two novels, and I don't read as much as I would like. A writer should be reading all the time. Yeah, but I don't like to. I don't like to read when I'm on a project, and I'm almost always on a project. Yeah. But um, over Christmas, it's like all right, I'm not doing any writing at all. I'm just going to read. And I I read Richard Russo's Straight Man, mm -hmm. which is from 1997. And I read, uh, I'm going to mispronounce his name, Ocean Wong, I think is his name. Uh, yes, On Earth, I, We're I, Briefly Gorgeous. I, I wanted to talk to you about this book. Which is a, which in itself kind of is a, is more of an experimental, kind of a fragmentary novel in itself. And it just struck me. I mean, there, there's, there's been this sort of thing going, I don't know if you're familiar with it or not, but there's this thing about, um, it's, it's kind of a social media thing where people are trying to get um people are trying to oh gosh i'm blanking on what the hashtag what they're calling it now um but it, it's like it, basically the whole point is saying look you can't you can't we shouldn't be just always reading shakespeare or reading faulkner or whatever in high school you know th there's all these things about representation right that like like you know a, a kid from, you know, whatever stereotype you want to say, a kid from the Bronx, from, you know, Harlem or, or you know, whatever you want to say, just is not going to identify with this Hemingway book. And so there's just no point to even <laughs> teaching it. I mean, you can teach it, but you need to, you, you need to disrupt the text. Yeah. That's the name. Okay. Are you familiar with this at all? I'm not. Uh, 
it, it's it's you know it, again like any one of these sort of twitter feeds it, twitter you know sort of melees it, it's it's gone back and forth yeah but it but it's an interesting it's an interesting topic and i was thinking about it as i was reading these two books because they're both wonderfully well written they're both very good stories but richard russo's novel just felt so insular hmm. and like written for you know a, such a very small audience of academics basically yeah um versus this other story on earth we're briefly gorgeous which you know, is is the story of, I mean, apparently a very autobiographical story yeah. about a uh, gay Vietnamese kind of refugee or the, the mother of a Vietnamese refugee who falls in love with a white kid who has a, you know, has an opioid addiction and kills himself over the course. And it's like, the, that the novel it just struck me this novel has its fingers in so many other pies than what the richard russo book is doing yeah and i mean i read these back to back and it, i i was like it's just wow the, the on earth for briefly gorgeous just strikes me as such a superior novel yeah it's, even the, but because of that i mean I, I just started thinking about it's like all right but i'm more of a richard russo in myself i mean i know that i am in terms of like when i'm writing about my concerns and my life or taking elements from my life which i mean both of i think both of these novelists are doing what most novelists i i think do from time to yeah. time um it, it, it's just like all right i mean if, if i'm thinking myself how do i broaden it's like if i like i mean i guess the base of the story is like when you're when you're talking about a story it's like well should you just write for yourself? Should you be thinking of only yourself as the audience when you start to do something? Well, you know? yeah, and, I know a I lot mean, of people don't. A lot of people write specifically for an audience. And I know if you're a genre writer, you're, you're told that's what you should be doing. It's not, it's certainly what, not what I do. And I've run into issues writing for myself, but you know, I feel the pull of like, okay, I need to pick up the pace here or whatever you know, because yeah. you're being defined. But so you posted about on earth were briefly gorgeous. So I picked it up and, you know, within two pages, I'm just like spellbound. And mm -hmm. it's, it's, and it has probably only really ever happened to me before with Cormac McCarthy, where mm -hmm. I'm just completely absorbed in, in, in the language. And so I wanted to ask you, you know, think of all the you know, millions of words that you've written. Um, and I think of all the words that I've written and I'm like, I could write for the rest of my life. And I don't think I could write like that. I don't think I could conjure phrases and sentences the way Ocean Vuong does. I mean, do you, do you feel like it's just kind of a muscle that you build and you can eventually get to that place? Or is it just, I mean, and this is, of course, this is his debut novel. Which is, yeah. I mean, I know he's he's very he's written a lot of short fiction and and poetry, but you know, I, primarily a poet. I think. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I was just astounded. I mean, I, I'm I'm you know dog earing pages all over the place. Like, like this one half a sentence is just yeah. amazing. <laughs> you know, and I'm like, I'm, yeah, where does yeah. that? How do you conjure those kinds of? And you you're writing you, you your writing is. It's very strong, and like you have, you have a turn of phrase that feels very natural to me. But it's you can jump in, you can jump into not only different voices very easily, you can jump into different periods of time very easily. And I think some of your strongest fiction um, it, it are, are period pieces. You know, you mentioned your your Hemingway book, and and what I've seen of that, I've I've really gravitated towards. How much of it? So yeah, how much of it is muscle? How much of it? Okay, this is what I'm going to write. And I've done so much writing before that I know uh, now that I have the idea, I can just just generate it as opposed to s slogging through sentence by sentence. Um, well, I don't I don't think turn a phrase or to be, you know, or the, the crafting of a beautiful sentence, say, I don't particularly think that that's muscle. Um, I think the muscle of writing comes more from uh, shows up in other areas. I mean, it, it, in terms of it shows up in characterization, how quickly you can 
develop a character, um, how you go about developing a character, and also plot, depending, you know, again, whether you're whether your story is plot heavy or more character centric and not much is going on, but yet you convey that there is kind of stuff going on underneath, you know? Yeah. Um, a lot of experience from writing will, will help you do that um, better than you have each time for each, each work in the past. And, and editing Hopefully. too, I would probably say, right? Your ability to recognize that that doesn't fit yeah. in the story. Yeah, that or 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 technical things like, you know, I, I was working on a novel not too long ago, and it became clear to me, it's like this is the wrong point of view. I mean, I'm trying to tell this story from a char- particular character's point of view, and you know, a little bit of intuition and, and a little bit of you're in the process of trying to tell the story and it's just not happening because there are other things that you need to be able to leap into. Yeah. Um, a younger me probably would have just went ahead and slogged on and slogged on and slogged on despite the growing fear that, that there, there's failure lurking on every page. Yeah. And now, now you just, I mean, you, you, you learn to, you learn to uh, not call it quits, but, to reevaluate um, and to redesign and redeploy yourself, um, you yeah. know, as need be. As a result, I mean, I think, I think basically that one of the differences between a, a an experienced writer and a and a non experienced writer is just the strength of the first draft. Yeah, you know? how much work uh, needs uh, to be done. Exactly. Well, you, I mean, just talking about editing, you are very committed to editing. You will. You will, from my experience with you, you will take a, a, a fully fleshed first draft and go through it ten to twelve times. It seems like, um, and, and be it's willing, be, yeah. yeah, and be willing yeah. to really gut it. Um, do you are you able to get a sense of okay, this is done, or I'm done with it, and and anything I do to it now is overkill. Uh, uh, the overkill portion, definitely. I mean, I think you can, you can edit something to where you can polish it and you polish it and it gleams, but it's also dead. So what are you hoping to get out of 2021? We'll wrap this up and, and do our, 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 our little storytelling. Um, well, I'll be finishing up hopefully the last draft of a, of a, of a novel that, uh, it's in the second draft now and I'm having a, I'm having a friend kind of line edit it for me, um, and that's called Confessions. It's another story set in uh, set in Kentucky. I've done so so much of my work of late, really, of the last few years, has been sort of science fiction and fantasy and horror. But uh, those aren't really the types of stories that I read generally. I'm going just more. I'm I'm trying to write much more, just like slice of life, people's lives in the everyday world, um, sorts of stories. So so long fiction versus uh, short fiction sounds like this year. Yeah, or, or realistic fiction yeah. versus uh, genre fiction. Yeah, I have nothing against genre fiction. I write it all the time. I, I, I respect it very much, but it's just not kind of where my personal passion is at the moment. Um, so there's that. I uh, hope to finish that. Hope to get that out to agents and see if somebody will will bite on that. Um, I think my I have, an, I have a novel about Oscar Wilde that I think gets will get published later this year. Um, or early next year. Uh, that's from Lethe Press. They're the people that do my, have done most of my other stuff. Um, um, yeah, I'm just, I, I, I do want to write just more short fiction this year yeah. rather than novels. Okay. Um, well, you, that, that would be a career goal. You, you are probably the most prolific writer that I know, and your production is, you know, astounding. So I, I don't doubt at all that you'll, Get a lot of words in this year. Well, when you don't have a social life. <laughs> That's the key, huh? Yeah. All right. So we're going to make up a story. Yeah. And we're going to see how this goes. Um, so I'm going to ask you a couple of questions because you're you're in charge of, 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 of picking the sentence that we're going to start with. So uh, pick left, middle, or right? Let's do middle. Okay. One through seven. Five. 
Uh, one through 20. 10. One through 100. 50. I'm going straight down the middle on everything. Yeah. Okay. One through, <laughs> and finally one through five. Uh, I guess, I guess we'll go three. Okay. So you pick the middle shelf behind me, uh, yeah. the middle, the middle uh, section behind me, fifth shelf, book number 10, page 50, sentence number three. So I'm going to go. I'm hoping it'll be one of my own novels. That's what I'm hoping. I, yeah, I strategically nice. placed it. Well, I'll be right back. So I have to tell you, strangely enough, this was about three books away from Trigger Point, your book. So uh, this is actually an advanced reader copy um, of Rock Island Rock by Ear Price, and it's in my signed section. Um, so he signed this book for me. And so, uh, so I'm going to read this sentence, and then you can take it from there. And I don't, we don't have to do any, we can just... See where it goes. Mark started in his distinctive gravel rolled growl as if he just smoked an entire pack of unfiltered camels in one big puff and then washed it down with a boot of rebel yell. Where's the remote control? You already lost it five times already. Why do I have to do everything for you? As I'm your husband and I say what's what? You know, I'm pretty tired of your attitude here. I think I'm just going to go off to the store and see where that leads me. Well, I better not lead you back here unless you can find me the damn remote control. Mark stared down at the couch and saw the remote control exactly where he had just left it five minutes ago. He took another swig of his beer, sat down on the couch, and wondered what happened to his life. Then Mark started to turn the TV on. And then, as he thought more about what had happened to his life, he remembered the loaded gun that was under the couch cushion, almost directly beneath the remote control. As he thought about the gun, he flicked his gaze to the TV screen, and he saw something strange. It looked a lot like his house on the local news, seen from above. And if he thought about it, and if he listened just enough, he did hear the thump, thump, thump of a helicopter far in the distance. Mark took another swig of his whiskey. <laughs> so he had successfully transferred from beer to whiskey in those few seconds that he was happy about. And he saw this, the scroll on the TV said, suspect identified and the local murder, police on scene. Mark turned the TV off. Oh shit, he said. He had forgotten what his future self had told him. <laughs> that his future self had murdered or would murder his wife in the next 15 to 20 minutes. But how did the police know that? Maybe it was just the whiskey talking, but he looked over to his wife. She was combing her hair, trying to get the knots out of it. And she wore that same look that she wore every day, and it drove him crazy. He didn't know why it angered him so much when she scrunched up her mouth just like that. But in that moment, he felt himself forming into a rage. This is really bad, Mark thought. If my future self is correct, I'm about to kill this woman. I've thought about killing her many times, but it also means that if I kill her, then I will become my future self and I'll somehow travel back in time to my past self, which is also my present self, and the circle will never be broken. There's only one way that this can end. Mark, impressed by his depth of knowledge and thought, slowly reached his hand under the couch cushion, felt the cold handle of the gun, and he slid it out, held it up against his chest. He sat down on the couch, then leaned back, thinking that that couch cushion should really be replaced. He caressed the gun softly with his left hand. 
I'm not going to become my future self, Mark thought. My wife may not ever remember where the damn remote control is, but she's not a bad person. And even though I hate her often, I'm not going to kill her. There's one way to end this circle. There's one way to keep me from becoming my future self who will come back and travel in time to talk to my past self, which is also my present self. <laughs> he was starting to get a headache. So he put the gun into his mouth and then he decided at the last minute to turn the TV back on. And when he did, there was no local news. There was no shot of his house. It was just the price is right as it always had been. The price is always too much, he thought. He took the gun out of his mouth and then reconsidered killing his wife. He decided that maybe she did deserve to die after all. After all, he had asked for the remote control and she had not helped him find it. And then at the last minute, he changed his mind, stuck the gun in his mouth and pulled the trigger. His very last thought before he died was, Oh shit, I forgot to load the gun. <laughs> he turned to his wife. Honey, have you seen my bullets? The end. That was good. I think I That was good. I like that. I think I think, you know, I think we could have that uh, transcribed and uh sell that. See people out there writing and storytelling is so easy. That's right. It is so easy. That's right. Well, listen, Sean, thank you so much for calling in today and, and chatting. Yeah. I really had a good time talking to you. And uh, yeah, I look forward to our next uh, critique group. Thanks. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it was a real pleasure. I, while I've been in quarantine all this time, I figured I could either try to work and lose some weight or develop my pithiness. So I've been working on developing my pithiness because that's easier. And I hopefully that came out. Yes. That came through yeah, today. You so. came across as very pithy. Great. So. Thank you, sir. Thanks, Sean. Right. I'll talk to you later. Right. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Bye. 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 So that was me and Sean and Guff is now in the room prowling about. Come here. You want to see Guff? Come here. This is Guff. He's a Bengal and he's out of his goddamn mind. So that was me and Sean. Had a great conversation with him. Make sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel, please, and sign up for my newsletter. And you can find out anything about uh, me and my upcoming uh, events at carterwilson.com. Until the next episode, take care.